Well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that uh, super kind introduction. One, one problem with these kind introductions is that you're sort of almost set up to be sort of all downhill from there on. And, and how do you sort of live up to that? And, and then I'm going to make myself a little bit sort of even more vulnerable to, to the downhill uh, because I'm going to do two experiments with you all today. Uh, one is that uh, uh, I've spent 25 years of my life just studying and worrying about one disease, heart failure, uh, and that's not what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about something in which I have no expertise at all. So that's uh, another thing to worry about. And then the third experiment that I'm going to do today uh, is that uh, I was sort of thinking about it. I sent some slides earlier on and whatnot, and then last night, I don't know what sort of inspired me or derailed me, I sort of, you know, dunked about half of those slides and changed the slides, and, and I'm going to talk a lot more about philosophy than I'm going to talk about medicine. So uh, if at the end of the day it's a bomb, uh, then, then you know what, that's okay. <laughs> so uh, my, my disclosures are at the bottom of the slide, but uh, I'm not going to talk about any therapy at all, so it's uh, uh, wholly irrelevant to the topic that I'm going to uh, talk about. Uh, okay. So let's just start with, uh, with, with what the American body looks like uh, uh, today. So this is, uh, uh, these are the data published by the American Heart Association, completely sort of online uh, 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 data that are out there uh, for, uh, for uh, this. And the 2023 update has just come out, basically uh, showing the, the, the same thing. Uh, so right now, uh, if you look at the overweight and uh, obesity, we're talking about uh, 20% prevalence of obesity in our adolescents and young kids, right? So one in five young kid is obese. If you start looking at adults, uh, we're talking about obesity of 40%, obesity, not overweight. If you look at overweight and obesity together, uh, 75%, three in four of us uh, are overweight. Uh, we have a whole bunch of folks that are walking around about 40% with a total cholesterol of greater than 200, uh, despite of the fact that there are plenty of cheap uh, therapies available to treat uh, uh, hyperlipidemia. Hypertension, I mean, this is sort of really uh, depressing that no matter what we do, I'm, I'm seeing sort of graphs like this for, for the past 20 years. Uh, hypertension is almost ubiquitous uh, as you grow older, older population, 80, 90% have hypertension. Uh, but if you look at sort of the four bars that, you know, you have hypertension, you have been diagnosed with it, you have been treated, and then you have been treated to goal, uh, we are still stuck at about 20% or so. There are some race, gender variation there as well, but overall arching is that 80% of the patients are not uh, treated to goal. If you look at the diabetes, uh, pre-diabetes, so again, that proportion uh, goes hand in hand with uh, obesity, so about 10, 15% of the population has diabetes. Uh, and, and, and ditto the same as hypertension lit, uh, data that diabetes is diagnosed, treated, and treated to goal, we are at about 20% or so. And then if you look at prediabetes, remember, I mean, we sort of draw the line in, in the sand, uh, but then every now and then we have to change the, the, the line that we have drawn, right? I mean, we learned that from cholesterol, which was 300 and then 240 and then whatever, and then it's LDL is important and it's 130, 100, 70. So, so, so as we learn more, and clearly patients with prediabetes, whether we call them prediabetes or diabetes or whatever, A, a lot of the prediabetes patients have, uh, uh, if you do their HOMA uh, uh, test, uh, they probably will meet the criteria for diabetes. But irrespective, uh, as compared to hemoglobin A1C of less than 5.7, those with 5.7 to 6.5 are clearly at a higher risk. And if you uh, combined prediabetes and diabetes, now you're uh, getting to 40% range on that metric uh, as well. Uh, there's a whole bunch of folks uh, with a, a UACR walking around uh, among <coughs> us and a whole bunch of folks that have a GFR, uh, which has some degree of uh, abnormality. Uh, so again, if you look at uh, moderate to severe uh, UACR, uh, about 10% of the population. If you look at uh, mildly decreased uh, EGFR, about 40% of the population. So how are we doing overall, uh, putting all of these data together? So this is the cardiovascular mortality risk. So remember that this is not opioid crisis. This is not uh, 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 COVID. This is cardiovascular mortality. Uh, and that after, there has never been a decade uh, since, I don't know, US came into existence that every decade the mortality has not gone down, and now for the first time the cardiovascular mortality has reversed and it's actually going up. 
Uh, and I don't know whether this is hyperbole or whether this is truth or not, but a lot of intelligent people I've uh, uh, heard them say that this young generation will be the first generation of Americans with a lower life expectancy than their parents' generation. That has never occurred in the U.S. Every subsequent generation had a longer uh, life expectancy overall. Now, I'm a heart failure doctor, so I'll show you sort of some data on, on heart failure, but I mean, th these are some generic comments. My comments are true for lipids, uh, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, CKD. For all of those things, you can make the same uh, comments. So, uh, I mean, you know, heart failure is common. It's growing, half ref, half PEF. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we know that heart failure hospitalizations are, are growing as well, uh, both in men and women. Uh, so it's a big epidemiologic uh, problem. Uh, so, okay, so there's a lot of uh, problems that are very common, uh, I don't know, common flu or whatever, uh, but, but the two places where you say, well, the disease is really important is that one, uh, if it is costly, and two, if it is, uh, 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 leads to poor outcome. So yes, heart failure is very common, but is it costly and does it lead to poor outcome? So if you look at, you know, when, when President Obama became the president, this obviously now goes many years back, uh, you know, we have this dynamic in U.S. healthcare that like every four years we worry about healthcare in the election cycle and all of these things and then elections happen and you kind of just forget about it and you move on. Uh, so at that time, uh, he had a bipartisan commission which was led by uh, Senator uh, Alexander Lamar from Tennessee uh, and, uh, you know, how to lower the U.S. healthcare cost. Uh, and they uh, published their report, so it's again freely available on, on, on the internet. Uh, and they said that the first line, if you look at their table of content, so this is not, you know, some page 365 that you have to dig into to find this information. Right on the table of content, it says that uh, too many hospitalizations, too costly, need to reduce hospitalizations in the U.S. And under that, there was a sub-bullet on the cover page, on the, sorry, the, the table of content page, heart failure hospitalization, right? So heart failure hospitalization is a huge deal for Medicare. That's why you have the the uh, hospitalization reduction program and the penalties or whatnot. So this is not a disease that, that people are, are unaware of and the government doesn't worry about it. And this is a disease that has horrible outcomes. You're talking about 45, 50% risk of mortality within five years of diagnosis. Each hospitalization leads to higher risk of hospitalization. So you meet all the criteria, common disease, growing disease, very costly disease, very poor outcomes. The question is, are we just impotent uh, against this disease? And the answer is absolutely not. If you look at the four therapies, uh, uh, RNA beta blocker, MRA, and SGLT2 inhibitor combined in patients with HEF-REF, you're talking about a relative risk reduction for mortality of about 70%, absolute risk reduction for about 25% for two-year treatment with an NNT of four. I mean, we're talking about incredibly potent therapy uh, if you were to increase the outcome. And what's the composite benefit? So if you look at the red line, the red line is not no therapy in HEFREF. Red line is on ACE inhibitor and beta blocker. So this can tell you how bad the outcomes are, that if there were no ACE inhibitor beta blocker, it will really just plummet. And then you move from the red line to blue line. If you move from ACE inhibitor beta blocker to ARNI beta blocker, MRA, and an SGLT2 inhibitor, and we're talking about an average increase in survival of almost six years six years, even uh, if you're mid-50s, even octogenarians, you're talking about increasing survival by one to two years. Uh, so common disease, growing disease, huge cost to the society, high mortality rate, and have incredibly effective therapies. And these are not high-tech therapies like, you know, gene deletion and all that. There. So these are like just sort of four pills that, that we need to give to the patients. So how well are we doing? So there are a lot of data out there. I always involved uh, in this trial in this registry and uh, uh, when you show the data that the therapies are not being given these are not my patients my patients are, uh, the cost of the drug is too expensive so we don't give the drug because it's costly uh, you know how can you say on a cross-sectional data Maybe all the patients who are not getting the therapy, uh, we were just giving it. So if you were to come back, you know, everybody will be on a therapy. Maybe it's contraindication. Oh, well, in the electronic health record, you know, you, you guys, you researchers, you really don't know uh, because you can only capture absolute contraindications, right? GFR less than 31. 
whatever, uh, uh, but you don't know the relative contraindication. Nobody this is dizziness and this. The way this design was won, the case for form said that even if we 100% disagree with you, we will give you the credit any reason for not giving the therapy. So somebody has a GFR of like 95 and a systolic blood pressure of 160 and, and, and you say, I don't want to give MRA because it causes dizziness, we'll give you the credit. Whatever reason you want to give, we'll give it because we want to come to the pure denominator and then we'll look at the baseline therapy and then we will follow the patient and we'll come back after a year and see what therapy has changed, right? So this is sort of as uh, easy. And we were really because there are uh, uh, two inherent biases uh, in this registry. One is that, so this was about 150 sites, you know, private practice, academic, uh, 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 cardiology, primary care, whatever. So first, there's a selection bias that sites that are interested in heart failure are the ones that are participating, right? So there's the sites. The second bias is that we told them that we are going to come back, we are going to reevaluate, and we will compare across sites. So now you are also have this a little bit of a competitive uh, juice is going as well. So for two reasons, we thought that we will be, uh, 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 we'll get a falsely high number. What we found in this registry, and this is a close to 4,000 or 3,500 patients, that after taking out all the not questioning therapy uh, was given in about 25% of the patients. 75% of the patients were either on one or two drugs, ACE inhibitor or beta blocker or both, but not triple therapy, uh, with no absolute or relative contraindication or any given reason. And cost is absolutely not an issue because ACE inhibitor, beta blockers, and MRA are all three generic. All three are generic. And yet 75% of the patients were not on triple therapy, let aside uh, 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 quadruple therapy. Now, we have done a ton of study, you know, high versus low blood pressure made no difference when we came back after a year, uh, made absolutely no difference. Those, of, I mean, we have looked at it in every different way and all of that is published. And this is not particular to heart failure if you look at the diabetes care and you look at the comprehensive cardiovascular risk production, uh, risk uh, uh, management, lipid management, uh, CKD management and glucose control, again, less than 10% of the people get that, uh, get that care. Uh, and, and, and the fundamental thing is that in this day and age, uh, all of that uh, uh, can be corrected today. So first of all, uh, it is an unbelievably high bar for something to be recommended for treatment. So first of all, these are not sort of willy-nilly recommendations. Uh, the, the, the randomized controlled trials that have shown benefit with, you know, ACE inhibitors or RNA or MRAs or beta blockers or SGLT2 inhibitor, these are thousands of patients worth of trials. And their p-value is less than 0 0.0001 and there's a 25% relative risk reduction. So none of this is in gray zone. So that's step one. This step two, the FDA, as we all know, is conservative, right? So they go through the FDA bar as high to something gets approved. And then the academic bar with professional societies is even higher because they just don't want to, you know, uh, uh, be blamed for, for being too liberal. So it, after meeting three bars, all of these are class one indication that there is no reason to not do it. Not doing it is, is sort of a bad thing. And we can correct all of this today. And the reason why I, I say that we can correct all of this today is that I work, work in a health system uh, that has 51 hospitals. All of those hospitals are on the same electronic health record. We have about a thousand outpatient centers. They're all on the same electronic health record. And, and figuratively speaking, I, I'm not talented enough to do that, but figuratively, I, right on my desktop, can track any population across the entire system and find out where are the gaps and where are the deficiencies and put in some methods to go ahead and sort of rectify uh, uh, these cares. Uh, but none of this happens. Whether it's lipid, people are sort of walking around with, with, with dyslipidemia. I did this study in hypertension we sort of never published uh, that, uh, in Mississippi, is that people are coming in with at least three documentation of systolic blood pressure of 160 to their ophthalmologist, to their dentist, to their internist, to their whatever. And no changes in medication has been met. Like over and over again, we are documented systolic of more than 160 and nothing was changed uh, in terms of their healthcare. So, so the question is, how can it be? Uh, how is it possible that you have 
uh, uh, common disease, growing prevalence, high mortality, high cost, high cost to the society, and easily available. There is, and, 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 and nobody is uh, as uh, 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 a given. So, uh, I, I'm going to like completely go uh, der derail here and go sort of off the hook and say things that you guys will start sort of questioning. Should we have really invited him for grand rounds? <laughs> so, so, so let's first talk about what human beings are capable of doing if we want to do and, and sort of what aspirations we can have. So you know that there's a lot of sort of interest in, um, uh, in certain sectors in uh, interplanetary living. So have human colonies in Mars and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, we can sort of make fun of uh, 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 Elon Musk, but, but there's a whole sort of group of, sort of people that are seriously working on making the human race uh, interplanetary race. So one question that comes up is that how are we going to feed people, right? So if you go there, you know, I mean, what will be the crops looking like and food come out, what come? And one of the idea that is, uh, is this idea uh, that plants make energy by uh, uh, sunlight uh, or some form of light uh, by using chlorophyll, uh, which is in the, on the leaves. So there's, a, there's experimentation going on on something called chlorohumin, whether we can have chloroform in human skin. And can part of the human need for energy be derived from light with the use of chloroform, chlorophyll, not chloroform, chlor, chlorophyll uh, in the skin and, and develop a chlorohumin? I have no idea whether any of this crap is going to work or not. But the idea here is that if we want to think something big and try to achieve something big, we can start sort of really thinking big. Now let's move on to that from that to a little bit more sort of a real life thing. So this is asteroid mining. This is like right now happening. Like we are sending like these things that go to like asteroids around our galaxy and we start sort of mining minerals and, and, and things from that. This is sort of happening uh, right now. You know, I work in a center. I had no idea until a year and a half ago that there is such a thing, but apparently Bader Scott and White is sort of interested in this and, and we have a whole series that we have done uterine transplants with live birth. Like so, so infertile women that had some sort of a uterine problem uh, that there was a uterine transplant that then led to a successful pregnancy with successful babies being delivered. Uh, and now these two things are just going to change the practice of medicine in the future. You know, right now we are worrying about immunologic diseases and cancer. I mean, this is all coming to cardiology. So this is immune modulation with CAR-T therapy and gene therapy uh, with CRISPR therapy, right? So, so can you just imagine like one day somebody is like just sitting in the cafeteria and you know start talking about like gene splicing, right? I mean, so, so when we think big and now all of this is in real life practice. Uh, the PCSK9 gene deletion therapy trial is going to be presented at AHA in the next two or, or, or three. So the question is, why on one hand we can dream and do like these impossible to think about things, and why on the other hand there are like common sense things that we are completely, you know, uh, 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 incapable of doing. It's like, you know, I mean, we, we, we can send a person to a moon to the, to the moon, but we cannot give like five milligrams of lisinopril, right? I mean, that's what, sort of what it, it, it boils down to as a society. So, so the question is, sort of what, what, what defines our, our human behavior? So I sort of like this framework called COMBI, which is capability, uh, opportunity, and motivation. So all of these examples that I gave you, whether creating chlorohumin, which is, we don't know whether it's gonna work, asteroid mining, which works, and uterine transplant and, and, and CRISPR therapy and CAR-T therapy. These are the five examples I gave you. When somebody thought about that, there was zero capability. There was zero capability. We had no clue where to even start when somebody thought that. There was zero opportunity. The only thing that was there was motivation. And on the motivation, basis of motivation, people went ahead and created opportunity, created capacity, changed the behavior, and created those things. And when it comes to giving five milligrams of lisinopril, we have all the capability, we have all the opportunity, and no motivation. No motivation at all. And we just keep publishing, you know, my people like myself, you know, the reason you have 1,000 papers is because you keep writing the same paper over and over again every two years, right? It's like people are not getting beta blockers, then two years later people are not getting beta blockers, then two years later people are not getting beta blockers. I mean, it's unbelievable, like nothing has changed overall. Uh, which is which is sort of pretty pretty interesting. Uh, so so how do we sort of change this this uh, uh, paradigm? 
So I don't know how many of you sort of know this concept of, of Nash equilibrium and uh, uh, the, the prisoner's dilemma. So, so the Nash equilibrium is basically says that if there are two players that are playing the game, uh, you get to a point uh, where you optimize your wins and losses and it is in the best interest of both players to not change the game. Because if you try to win, it will come at the other person's loss and therefore the other person will do something which can potentially hurt your gains that you're getting today. So the Nash equilibrium is where it is best thing for both players to not change the game uh, overall. So that's called sort of the Nash uh, uh, equilibrium. And I think we are GTO'd, which is sort of a, a, a business term for game theory optimized. Uh, and, and that basically, in my mind, that the three big uh, 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 companies for healthcare, which are the, the insurance companies, the, the drug and device companies, and then the healthcare delivering companies like hospitals and, and that landscape is changing. Uh, they're all in a, in, a, in a Nash equilibrium, right? So everybody is sort of in a, at an optimal place and everybody sort of points fingers at each other that, oh, the drugs are too expensive, oh, the insurance company, you know, why we should have single-payer healthcare system. Uh, but nothing changes. And nothing changes because we are in a, in a Nash equilibrium. Uh, and there are incredibly misaligned uh, uh, incentives, which is, which is for some, some other day. So the question is, you know, what do we do as an individual, right? So uh, 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 this will change by, by exercising your civil responsibility. So, uh, you know, some of us on this room will be uh, right-leaning, some of them will be left-leaning. Uh, we live in a democracy, we vote, and then things change, uh, and sometimes slower than what we like to do, but, but there is some wisdom in, in not to have too many fast changes. So whether you don't like this game theory optimization, whether you believe in uh, lowering uh, drug prices by Medicare, negotiating drug prices, whether you believe in single-payer uh, 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 system for, for insurance, all of that is something that, that you need to go and vote and, and vote your conscience and, and, and decide what is for yourself. But what do we do today in our hospitals? You know, that's societal, but let's not look outside. Let's sort of look inside of what, what, what we can do. So I can sort of give you this, this sort of uh, uh, interesting thing. So I wrote this editorial uh, that, you know, we, we give polypharmacy a really bad rep and, and polypharmacy is really the best thing that has happened to us, right? So now by polypharmacy, I don't know, I, I don't mean to say like, you know, this multivitamin sort of industry or whatnot. I'm talking about the indicated polypharmacy because what's the alternative to polypharmacy, right? I mean, if we were all thin and all biking to work and all just eating carrots all day, that's a different story, but that's not what we do. So in the current era, what do we do? We have this like unbelievable comorbidity burden. So, so we keep talking about this comorbid, uh, co uh, polypharmacy is bad, polypharmacy is bad, polypharmacy is bad. So we try to make this point that actually polypharmacy is a blessing. I mean, it's great, it's progress. Just please give polypharmacy, don't worry about it. And then like somebody tweeted, basically we're just saying that yes, there is side effects and there is cost, but then there is cost for comorbidity and then, then uh, you don't have the side effect of the drug, but then you have the side effect of the worsening comorbidity. So I mean, just sort of put some, some, some balance in your thing. And then somebody sort of you know, tweeted uh, uh, this out. And, and, and this was my earlier days of Twitter engagement where I was a little bit more sort of naive and idealistic than I am now. So I actually started engaging with people. Boy, they were just like trashing me that, oh, you're a shill for pharmaceutical industry and you're pushing drugs and this is like all crap and polypharmacy is the biggest problem and whatnot. And they just sort of, the, the vitriol that came and I'm like, I'm just saying, treat hypertension, like, you know, where is this sort of coming from, uh, 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 whatever. You know, th this sort of reminded me sort of this, this story. Uh, uh, most of you are too young to know who, who Harry Balafonte was. He sort of recently died, really sort of an American icon and, and, and hero. But at any rate, so he was a singer, very famous at one point. And uh, uh, he had a concert one, one day, and uh, 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 the person who uh, uh, played the harmonica uh, uh, got sick or whatever. So they were a little bit in a panic and they said, well, we need to sort of figure out uh, uh, somebody to play the harmonica in the, in the concert. Uh, so somebody in his group said, well, I know this kid and this kid is like really great and I've heard him play in you know, sort of like small clubs or whatever. Do you want me to get him? And he's like, well, I'm desperate. Yeah, sure, get whoever we can get. So they get this kid, this kid comes in and they, you know, he plays uh, harmonica and he just sort of 
you know, blows it out. I mean, he was just simply superb, and Harry Belafonte thanked him and everything and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And then the kid starts sort of walking away, and Harry Belafonte saw him, and that as he was walking away, there was a trash can, and he threw his harmonica and just walked away. So Harry Belafonte's interpretation was that this was this kid's uh, statement that he does not want to play that harmonica anymore because this was a white kid playing for a black singer. That was Harry Belafonte's sort of interpretation. Okay, so then 15, 20 years go by and that young kid that played harmonica was Bob Dylan. So now Bob Dylan becomes Bob Dylan. And then Bob Dylan, after he becomes Bob Dylan, he writes his biography. And he writes that one of the most transformative things that have that occurred in my career was playing for Harry Belafonte. And he gave me, and he just sort of wrote these great things about Harry Belafonte or whatever. So somebody took that book to Harry Belafonte and said that, look, remember you just said that this kid threw away because you felt that uh, uh, playing for a black uh, musician, he threw this away. And this is what he's writing from you. So Harry Belafonte called Bob Dylan and just sort of connected that, you know, thank you very much for sort of writing this. But can you tell me why did you throw away that harmonica? And he said, because I have this whole thing about that particular way of making the harmonica. And so I make my own ones with a word in a special way. And that when you play all night long, the word swells with my, with my uh, 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 saliva. And therefore I need to make a new one for everything. So I don't use it again, so I threw it away. So that's sort of an idea that we need to sort of give ourselves some grace and and you know that story just reminded me with how much criticism I get I got for just writing this editorial this has nothing to do with this grand round but I just wanted to talk about it <laughs> okay. but in a way it has something to do with this grand round because because it's, it's 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 the it's the corners from which you get resistant to treat chronic diseases is is uh, is, is pretty interesting uh, Hippocratic oath ought to go at this point. Uh, this is a huge problem. So Hippocratic Oath uh, is that first do no harm. The only way you do no harm is to do nothing, and by doing nothing, paradoxically, you do a lot of harm. Even aspirin, Tylenol, there is no such thing uh, that there is no, no, no harm. Uh, and also remember, not doing what we are supposed to do is doing harm, is doing harm. So getting hyperkalemia or dizziness with MRA is harm, but not giving MRA and taking the risk of sudden cardiac death and worsening heart failure and worsening CKD is doing harm also. So our jobs is not that easy. It's not only one side uh, of the, the equation. So, uh, so I, I think that the Hippocratic Oath should say that first do no net deliberate harm, which Cardiology does a lot of procedures that we don't need to do. Okay, so first, do no deliberate harm, and we really need to 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 absorb this that that not doing what needs to to be done uh, is 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 doing harm uh, as well. So then the other question sort of comes up is that you know there is a lot of discussion about truth, right? So what is the truth? What is the true therapy? What is the truth? How should we be sort of doing this, that, the other? Uh, and truth is a really complicated uh, uh, I issue. W what is the truth? I mean, I sort of look at it that there, there are three kinds of truths, right? So one is sort of the physical truth. And the physical truth is, is totally relative. So like, you know, the, the speed of light is a truth, right? Whatever the speed of light is. Except that that's the speed of light with whatever the dark matter and dark energy in which the light is traveling. If you change those constants, the speed of light will change. So yes. That's the truth, but it's a relative truth. Then you sort of have the canonical truth, right? So, you know, religion says something or government says something and, and, and stuff like that. And that's also relative. So like, you know, we say well, like, you know, don't kill, except that if it's across the border, then it's okay. And if it's an animal, that it's okay, right? So, so don't kill, but with a lot of exceptions. And then uh, we have the taste truth, right? So. I like red, that's my truth, and you hate red, that's your truth. I mean, there's no truth there, it's just taste uh, truth, and my truth is that I like sort of red color. Uh, so I think that, that, that uh, I have had the opportunity uh, to serve on the US guidelines 
uh, for five years, uh, and uh, I'm now the, the American representatives on the European guidelines. It is just fascinating to hear people's comments and how they perceive what they think are saying are, are, is the truth. And that is also much at a larger scale playing out in our society right now uh, between all the different factions. Uh, so I, I would recommend at least to the, to the younger people in the room, just be a little bit cautious of what you think uh, uh, is, is the truth. Uh, I'm not going to go about consciousness uh, because we're going to run out of time, but, but, but you might want to spend a minute or two thinking about where the ideas come from. Uh, when you say, well, well, I thought about it. Just, just dig into it. Just, just try to figure out, what do you mean I thought about it? That's for some other day. That's for a second run around someday. Okay. So, 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 so the question is, I mean, this is what it is and, 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 and uh, uh, where we are. So uh, this, uh, to me, is probably the best book that has ever been written uh, in uh, publishing literature. Uh, this is one thing I'm not going to concede. This is the truth. This is the only absolute truth. This is the best book ever written. And I'm just, I'm just going to sort of quote this one thing from it, uh, uh, from Dostoevsky. Uh, if it takes the suffering of a child to know the truth, the truth is not worth knowing. And I think that that's the burden that we carry, that uh, 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 technology and medicine and biology and, and all of that is good. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's about uh, 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 humanity and not about uh, 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 knowledge. And, and it's, 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 it's more about uh, uh, suffering per se. But coming back to this issue of individual responsibility, right? So, so we can all blame everybody. We can blame the insurance company. We can blame the, our health system. We can blame the, blame the, 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 uh, the CEO and I'm, don't get my nurse practitioner and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but there is an individual responsibility that we should really, really not uh, uh, shrug. Uh, th does anybody know uh, the story of Moloch? Probably not, right? So, so, so the Moloch is this whole sort of thing uh, that, that you sacrifice uh, some people so that the city looks beautiful. That's a whole, that's a second run around also, not for today. But the whole idea here is uh, that the institutions uh, do a lot of things because it's, it's in their interest, but it's not in the interest of the overall population. And I think we should sort of really, really, really look to, 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 to resist that as best uh, uh, as I can. So, so when it comes to sort of individual responsibility, you know, you have this option that you could be a helper, you could be a fixer, uh, or, or, or you could be a servant. Uh, the problem is that when you say that I'm going to help someone, you only help somebody who's weaker. So your mindset is uh, that somebody is weak and that I'm going to help. And when you're in the mindset of fixing something, well, you only fix something which is broken. If something is not broken, then you don't need to, need to fix, fix it. Uh, but when you serve, that's sort of the only time when you see something uh, in its entirety and, and, and as a whole. Uh, so fixing and helping always sort of creates the distance between the, the, the group of people and the person that you're, you're working with. And it's an experience of sort of, uh, of, of difference. Uh, but, but connection comes uh, when, when we sort of develop this mindset of, of uh, serving. So that is sort of one concept that we need to sort of keep in mind. Uh, in our profession. The second uh, thing that we need to keep in mind is that we need to optimize our sweet spot and our institutional sweet, sweet spot uh, to sort of get rid of a lot of things uh, which are really not, not that, that useful. So as you grow, uh, your wisdom increases because you have a lot of experience, uh, but our, our energy uh, goes down. So you have an earlier time in life where you have a lot of energy, but you don't know what you're doing. And then a later part of life, then you know exactly what to do, but you have no energy to do it. Uh, so, so there is this sort of uh, optimal point in the middle, which is sort of your sweet spot. And the question here is sort of how can you move the, the, the sweet spot uh, earlier and to, to, to a, a bigger uh, place? But the institutions have their sweet spot too, uh, that there are institutions where they are growing, they're getting sort of a lot of experiences, but then when they grow sort of too big, they, they tend to get really, really static and bringing innovation into institution becomes really, really uh, difficult. Uh, and the question is, how do we make few decisions, not get all bogged down in making 100 meaningless decisions that are not going to make any difference, any difference in patient outcomes, uh, few decisions, high quality decisions, and, and improve our uh, uh, sweet spot uh, overall, and, and, and if we can uh, stretch the duration of that. So, you know, I find it sort of pretty interesting that, that if I fly today, this afternoon, I'll fly Delta. 
so if my bag is lost, uh, if my check-in is late or whatever, you know, I don't say that, you know, Mr. Jones is like, you know, really sucks. I mean, I just say, you know, Delta sucks, right? So it's Delta takes the responsibility of my experience from beginning to end. You know, if you go and buy sort of, you know, something at Nordstrom and if you have a bad experience, you sort of blame Nordstrom. Healthcare is the only place where a person with chest pain can get completely, same chest pain can get completely different care if they see a primary care physician, a non-invasive cardiologist, a invasive cardiologist, or a cardiac surgeon. Completely different care. And the institution takes no responsibility. If you have four encounters with systolic blood pressure of 160, institution takes no responsibility of that. So, so this is sort of uh, 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 really interesting. I, I'll, I'll won't touch on population health and disparities, but that sort of brings us to the implementation science, and that's a whole different uh, issue. We'll, we'll discuss that for some, some other time. But, but these things are now almost sort of becoming a, a necessity. So right when you have drugs like Enclisiran for uh, uh, LDL, or all of these uh, silencers and, and other drugs that are coming out for, for amyloidosis, uh, A, do we really need to leave it to every nurse, doctor, and pharmacist to worry about these things and treat their patients? Can we not have systematic care where we can look into our populations, identify the patients with those things, screen the patients, tag the patients, and have centralized care? You know, for again, I'll go back to my health system. There are 51 hospitals. It is impossible to assume that there will be an amyloid expert in all 51 hospitals. But the other question is, why do we even need that? Why can't we have these centers and whatnot and sort of start thinking about re-engineering uh, 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 healthcare? The other thing which is really uh, 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 perverse in the healthcare system is this issue of patient centricity. So patient experience is really important. But, but when I go to these sort of meetings, you know, the, the whole thing is about sort of, you know, getting warm food and not cold food and good food and parking being close to the hospital and all that kind of stuff, which is all important. I'm not saying that this is not coming from the right place or all important. But the number one thing that our patients are wanting, the number one thing is to have nothing to do with us. They don't want to come to clinic. They don't want to come to hospital. They don't want to go to nursing home. They just want to live outside as little contact with us. And the only way we will do that is by treating their chronic comorbidities. The only way, or, or even early risk factor modifications so that they don't develop, or chronic comorbidities. So we need to sort of think about this patient centricity a little bit different uh, uh, than, than maybe, maybe sometimes we think. Uh, a virtual care is coming. I mean, we're gonna be sort of living in a, in a, in a different world uh, 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 anyways. All of these things are coming, so it's sort of just be, be ready for that. I don't know uh, uh, how many of you uh, sort of follow this literature on, on singularity where the computers will become self-conscious. Uh, this debate has sort of really gone up with uh, 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 the issue of, I mean, you know, gosh, I mean, this is like completely derailed now. Uh, what is the definition of life, right? So the definition of life is two things, reproduction and metabolism, right? So, so that's what life is, metabolism and reproduction. And the perp so, so this actually goes back to whether consciousness is a, is a fundamental property or an emergent property, but one way to think is that you put metabolism and reproduction together and sort of consciousness comes. Or you can go back and you can say, well, there was consciousness and that consciousness put together metabolism or, or, and reproduction. But if you think about it, I mean, we are carbon-based uh, 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 computers with carbon-based intelligence. Uh, that's really not a whole lot different than the silicon-based uh, uh, intelligence, which is computers. And now with all the things that we are seeing with chat GPT, boy, it's starting to look at like, like consciousness. And this is just sort of the beginning right now, right? I mean, people say, oh, well, you know, it sort of makes up things or whatever. I mean, come on, guys, it's like six months, you know, give it time. So, 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 so silicon-based consciousness uh, and silicon-based intelligence is here. And everything that we have developed with a computer is far better than us. Calculator can do things that we cannot do. Uh, 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 whatever, computers can do things that we cannot do. Everything that we have developed, except that it does not have consciousness. Now that we get into this chat GPT era, and we're given consciousness, uh, reproduction will be very easy because there is already metabolism, right? Electricity is metabolism. You don't need to like eat McDonald's uh, as, a, as a computer. Electricity is metabolism, so you now have metabolism, you do have consciousness. The only thing that misses is reproduction, but once the consciousness comes, the, the machines can run factories and make more computers, so the reproduction comes up uh, as well over time. 
so, so, so we'll see sort of what, what, what happens. I mean, I, I think that a lot of the, doc, the jobs that doctors are doing will go to sort of non-doctors, and a lot of the jobs that non-doctors are doing will, will sort of go to, to, to robots, and this is going to happen in my lifetime, and, and I'm not young, but this is going to happen in my lifetime. What I don't know is whether we'll reach singularity in my lifetime or not. Uh, but again, I sort of welcome that world. Uh, some people are sort of really afraid of that. I sort of welcome that world. But even before we go to those extremes, the, the use of, of computerized systems for healthcare uh, will become a, a reality. I can tell you, as a heart failure doctor, you know, my, my wife is an internist, a geriatrician, who sort of reminds me every time <coughs> That, that don't think too highly of yourself because you know one disease. And I can tell you at this point, I cannot keep up with heart failure literature. It's, it's physically impossible. I'm not talking about cardiology literature. I cannot keep up with heart failure literature, let aside cardiology literature, let aside the whole medicine literature, and to say uh, that computers are not gonna do a better job at, uh, uh, than, than, than us is, is, in my opinion, a, a little bit naive. I talked about the role of healthcare system, I think that uh, we focus a lot on traditional discovery science, but I think we need to have different nimble models for discovery science. Then this whole issue of population management science and implementation science, so that is for some, some other time. And I think this is sort of my last slide, I think. And that is sort of the, to, to, to end by sort of giving 10 points. Uh, this will sound a little preachy, sorry, but this is for young people in the room. Uh, that you know, we can blame all the things to the outside world, but, but, but we really need to take individual responsibility and there's a lot of things that we can do to improve our patient care today. So one thing is uh, individualized, uh, uh, recognize individual suffering. And when we don't treat patients well, we are perpetuating the suffering. And so one thing I used to do at, uh, at Mississippi that uh, I used to round with medical students uh, on their first day. So these are like all young, healthy, smart kids, uh, and, 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 and I would uh, walk with them uh, to uh, the patient floor from ground floor to the fourth floor. Now these are all young, healthy kids. By the time you get to fourth floor, you're, you're a little bit short of breath or whatnot, and then tell them that the patient that I'm about to see feels like that going to the bathroom, going to the kitchen, right? There is a lot of suffering which in our day-to-day 15-minute -day clinic appointment and whatnot that we tend to forget that we can impact uh, overall. So, so, so let's just keep that in the forefront of our mind. Uh, accept less than ideal. Again, I've done a lot of administrative jobs in my life. Some people who are not perfect, they are just not happy with anything. Just, just be happy if you can make something. This is really important, and that is sensitivity and specificity of, of, of medical decision uh, making. Uh, so, I can give you my bias. Remember, uh, I already sort of trashed the, the word truth, now I'm gonna sort of trash the word right. We are not in the business of making right or wrong decisions. We are in the business of making decisions whether you're gonna err. There is no escape from making a mistake. The question is what mistake you want to make. Assuming safety is the same, I would much rather treat more patients knowing that some patients are not going to benefit with this, but everybody who could potentially benefit gets the drug. Because I, in 2023, am not smart enough to carefully differentiate who will and who will not respond. There is another group of people out there which predominates, unfortunately, the guideline writing committees that say that not a single person who is not going to benefit should get the drug, even then limiting means that some people who could have benefited are not going to get the drug. That is an individual decision that you need to do, and I think this is very deeply rooted in our psyche of first do no harm principle, but I'll, I'll leave that to you. There's no right or wrong answer to this. Have a little bit of a servant mentality. Uh, realize your taste truths. A lot of the things that you think are the truth is just you've made it up. Uh, embrace change and comfort, and boy, there's a lot of change coming. Uh, so. Just be ready. Uh, uh, we're going to be living in a different world. Uh, uh, institutional Moloch, uh, I didn't really go into this, so skip that. Uh, I personally think that it will hurt pharmaceutical companies, it will hurt, obviously, insurance companies, it will hurt the doctors, uh, but the only solution for better care is a uh, single payer healthcare system. So I'll just sort of put my, my stakes out. Many of you will disagree with good reasons, but that's at least my, my, my perspective. 
we really need to create system responsibility. We just cannot live in a healthcare system where, where there's no accountability for what the population uh, management is or uh, and I think uh, some degree of uh, 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 humility uh, uh, knows. I mean, you, you guys know the the whole uh, Delphi, uh, uh, the, the Oracle of Delphi story. That when the, the Athenians went to the, the uh, Oracle of Delphi and asked, "Who's the smartest person on earth that has ever lived?" and they said Socrates. And they said, "Why Socrates?" And he said, "Because Socrates knows that he doesn't know anything." So it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, important. And again, for the younger crowd, I would. These two books, uh, uh, The Myth of Sisyphus and The Fall, uh, both are small books, both are with Camus, uh, and I would highly recommend, uh, uh, if you want to uh, uh, look at the world a little bit differently, uh, you might want to think about it. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. As I said, it's a little bit of an experiment, uh, but I think there's a lot that goes into our subconscious and our psyche that drives our behavior, uh, and bringing some of those things to our consciousness uh, may, may modify our behavior as an individual. Thank you so much. Uh, great talk. Again, the philosophical and thought-provoking. So as the director or the system chief for 51 hospitals, what are you going to do to modify the behavior in controlling hypertension? <laughs> <laughs> no, so yeah, so uh, uh, look, I mean, there are so many uh, uh, human barriers, uh, but, but we cannot just sort of give in to those barriers, right? And again, I'll go to my point number two, that, that uh, some Improvement is improvement. Uh, so uh, I've been there for a year, and, and there is a, there's a lot going on at the initial stages that I, and as I said, I was a transplant LVAD CCU cardiologist for the first 10, 15 years of my life, and then I became sort of a clinical trialist, mostly outpatient cardiologist. Uh, and at this point, I, I'm really just thinking about system management. Uh, this is a new field for me. Uh, I've been at it for a year. I don't know whether I'll have something good to show for or not, uh, but, but at least in five years, we'll, we'll do a lot of things. We'll learn a lot, and, and what will change, I, I don't know. But everything is right now in the beginning phases. I really have nothing to share. So right now, it's only talk. As you pointed out in the field of heart failure and heart transplant, you know, you're trained in your truth and when you move somewhere else you realize that that truth may not really be truth um, or there, maybe they're different truths. But one thing that you also said that spoke to me is talking about you know, individual responsibility um, in a culture where that is in some ways almost frowned upon because it's always somebody else's fault or someone other reason why this didn't happen. Um, as opposed to the core of what potentially could I do, you know, to change some of those things. So what advice do you have or what things have you found to be beneficial to try to bring back that at least enlightenment to people that there is, you know, uh, I think there is a, a, that ownership actually brings power, which encompasses change, but that enlightenment to have that happen, I think, is difficult. So any ideas? I, I'm not going to answer this question because I'm going to get into trouble. I, I can guarantee you I'm going to get into trouble. So I'll just give you sort of one, 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 one short sort of uh, 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 real communication uh, discussion that I had with my daughter. At least my mindset is uh, that the world gets into a better place as you go from small to big. So you, as an individual, you get better, and then your family, you make it better, and then your community, you make it better, and then it sort of multiplies. Uh, that's my orientation. Uh, so I think, well, I didn't. so I, I was talking to my daughter. I have a 15-year-old daughter, and uh, I had some sort of guess. So, so my, my my wife was born and raised in New York. She's sort of a extreme uh, uh, women's lib liberal, and now she is raising two daughters who are all sort of of the same thing. So we had a bunch of people and whatnot. Uh, and and at some point, and 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 I always thought sort of uh, uh, I was liberal and I was sort of center right, le center left leaning. Uh, but now in my household, I'm like extreme right because you know they, they have a totally different orientation. So we had a bunch of guests in our room, 
and they were just saying things, and I'm just saying, at some point, I'm like, guys, like, come on, like, you know, it's like, uh, 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 there's a little bit of different way of thinking about this. And my daughter just stood up, the 15-year-old, and sort of told all the guests that, please don't mind my dad. He was born in the 1900s. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so then, so I was talking to her, and it's like, she's given me this whole lecture on, like, global warming. And like, have you seen your bedroom? You know, like, I mean, can you just go and make your bedroom and just clean it up before you worry about sort of the global warming? Which is now, so now her interpretation is like, you know, oh, you don't care about global warming. And I said, where did I say I don't care about global warming? I'm just asking you to make your bedroom. So, I mean, that's my orientation. That's my non-answer to your question. what your thoughts are on equity, especially, you know, um, you know, talking about uh, chlorophyll in humans and um, uterine transplants that are successful, um, you know, a lot of money goes into this, you know, only few can benefit from it. Uh, even when we t think about interplanetary life, uh, that's also the interest and motivation comes from the fact that a select few might be able to make it. Um, what do you think about the investment and all that kind of research and then thinking about, you know, overall, you know, net benefit to everybody? You guys are recording this thing and it, <laughs> all of these answers are going to come to bite me at, at some point. Look, I mean, <sighs> human distribution is across Pareto distribution and not, not normal distribution curve. So, there is about a million people writing books, uh, but you know, five people sell 90% of the books. There are a million people singing songs, and there are you know, few people that have platinum album and you know, Taylor Swift or whatever. So a lot of people are doing a lot of things, uh, but a few people are sort of becoming sort of uh, a really, really uh, uh, successful. So, so the, the distribution of human achievement is a Pareto distribution and not a, not a normal distribution. You don't have sort of you know, uh, a smooth curve. Uh, what ends up happening is that uh, uh, you have two ways to look at it. One way of equity to look at it is that everybody should be equal, right? So if I am what I am, absolutely not because of anything that I have done. There are three things that made me who I am. Uh, the genetics I got, so I was born without any uh, major illnesses. Uh, I got the intel intellect from my parents, whatever my IQ was, uh, and my parents had an orientation towards education. That's it. I could be any person. I could be uh, uh, have a uh, IQ of 70. I could be born in a really poor family. Uh, so I see the world incredibly flat. I'm a very non-hierarchical person because all of us are basically based on our social lottery. It's really not that we are so 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 so, so great. So by that, you can say, well, we should have equity because some people are born unlucky and that everybody should be equal. So that's one perspective. However, the other perspective is that when you have uh, uh, some people who on the Pareto distribution are just, whether for genetic reason or whatever reason, are going to just run and do unbelievably great things, it raises the bar for everyone. So for instance, if you have $100 and if I have $1,000, there's no equity. I'm $900 richer than you. But if now I create something great and the society becomes great, our wealth doubles. So now you have $200, you're better than $100, but I have $2,000 and our gap is even bigger now. Rather than 900, it's $1,800 gap now, right? But the society average has gone up from $100 to $200. So everybody is much better today. Remember, in the 1990, the president of America did not have the cell phone that everybody on the street has today. So everybody gets better, but the disparities get larger. And I'll just stop here. Just uh, on a lighter note, um, when is India and Pakistan going to reach Nash equilibrium? <laughs> The singularities and computer consciousness will occur before that. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That was some very nice talk. Okay. Very Seriously, I mean, this was this is an experiment.